Welcome to Tech Simplified. And my name is Sly Gittins. And today we're continuing the Woman in Texting series. I have a special guest. Her name is Susan O'Sullivan. She was a leader at one of the companies that we both worked together. So what are the key qualities you believe are essential for effective leadership? Oh, there's a few, but I love that question. I think that the most important thing is empathy. You really have to understand the person. You've got to care. You have to be authentic um, because people will smell fake a mile away. So if you really don't care, it shows. So I think the empathy piece, you really have to care about people. And it's what you just said, really. You have to care that person is succeeding. You have to have the humility and, and then sometimes the emotional intelligence to back off and say, you know what, this person needs to take the limelight. It doesn't always have to be about me. It has to be about my team. So for me, it's you have to be authentic. I think you have to have some decent emotional intelligence just to understand um, interactions and be able to read people's body language and, and understand that. And I think you have to be accountable. That's the big, I mean, you can't point fingers, right? That's the one thing that if people make mistakes, it was like, all right, just be accountable for it and we'll figure it out. Because nothing is worse. You've already made a mistake. Nothing is worse than you're, you're just getting piled on and piled on. Acknowledge you made a mistake and move forward. That's one of the, for me, that accountability, take ownership, fix it and move on, but don't dwell on it. So I'd say those were really, for me, the most important part from a leadership perspective. And allowing your people to have the spotlight is so incredibly important and allowing their ideas to come forward. Uh, so I guess the other piece would be collaborative. I think you really have to, you pick people to be on your teams or you sometimes just inherit teams, but they're on that team for a reason. It's like you said, they have a certain skill set. Let them use that skill set. When I was building my teams, the most important thing for me was to find people that were different than I was. And I think this goes a little bit into the diversity piece of it, the equity and inclusion and the belonging piece. I already have me. I know what I'm good at and I know what I'm bad at. So I am going to surround myself with people who can really pick up the slack in the things that I'm not good on. And then also making sure that people are different on the team because everyone brings different experiences, different thought processes. And you need to embrace that. Because if I hired a whole bunch of people that were exactly like me, thought like me, we wouldn't get anything done. You got to be open to everybody's ideas. So I guess it does walk into a, a quality from a leader. I think they have to be open to different ideas, different thoughts, and, and explore them. You may not use them because at the end of the day, again, it goes back to the accountability. You have to make the decision. But be open enough to hear everybody's thought and idea. And again, if you have the luxury of being able to bring input in, get input. Why wouldn't you? I was reading a book and it talked about leaders in bad times, leader in good times, two different qualities. Good times, you can take the input. Bad times, you got to make sure you stay afloat. Right? There's a different type of communication that's needed. And I know when I made the switch, individual contributor to a director, communication was where I was failing at. Well, technically, I knew the tech stuff in and out, but now I had to write it, right? I had to write it pristinely. And my biggest weakness is grammars. What I end up doing is hiring an editor who would edit myself before I sent to my CMO. It cost me some extra money to do it, but I do, I would, I do the tech about it. I just sometimes needed help with that portion of it, but I made sure now on my team, even my scripts now, when I'm writing those, I have an editor, take a look at it. I have a video editor to make sure the pieces are actually in the right point. I know details for me might not be the best. I'm a typical marketing sale tech, but I know now for me, I need to have those type of people in there. I need the people who are very process focused. I need the people who Dot the I's and cross the T's. So now I know, like you said, how you build your team. Like even when I do my training, they always ask me for technical training. I'm like, you're probably not getting a job because of your communication. But then you do your homework on the culture. What do they like? Is everything about you? I had a good friend. Like he talks about all his sales wins. But you're going for a program, man. You got to scale that. You need to talk about how you scale those wins for other people. They don't care what you did individually. They want to know how you scale those. Man, yeah, it's good that you was a great sales rep, but you got to figure out where you're going into. So I think those are real, you said them really well in terms of the top leadership skills. And next thing is, how do you help exactly develop these qualities in DEI specialization? I think I mentioned it early. 
it's something we weren't talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion back in the day, but it was always something that you have to think through. It's important because it's a little bit what we just talked about. When you pick a team, you need to make sure that it's diverse because the studies are there. The studies are there from more diverse teams always make better decisions. We, We know that they're going to outsell, outperform teams that are traditionally not diverse. Again, why in the world would you not automatically start looking at diversity? I think this is one of the most important things. And diversity is everything. It's race, it's gender, it's identity, it's the way we think, it's their backgrounds. The other part, though, is how do you fit in after you get hired? And that is something that I really work with leaders on what kind of culture are you creating? You can hire the most diverse team in the world. You can go to the historically black colleges. You can go only hire women. You can do all of those things. But if they don't feel like they belong when they get into that building, if they're not given an amazing onboarding, if they're not listened to, they're not going to stay. And so then what was the point of you, you, you just checked a box? You really have to, you have to live it. And that's what I try to to imbue in my coaching from an executive is, are you thinking about those pieces? Because it's really important. You will be more successful if you take those thoughts and start really building them into how not only you hire, how you train, how you work your development programs, right? Like sometimes you're going to double down on bringing certain people up because if somebody hadn't like really taken a well, we probably need a a woman here in this table, right? Maybe I wouldn't have gotten there, right? So sometimes you really do have to say, let's really look at how we are here. Do we have a a, a balance here? Are we helping each other? Or are we all just thinking the same way? You start seeing we were always hiring from a certain college, a certain baseball team, a certain lacrosse team. You're like, that's great. And they're wonderful athletes and they, they have all the great qualities. But we're all starting to get a lot of group think. So let's just think about and I noticed that too when I first joined, because I remember when I went in to Ingram and they said in the, the new hire meeting, how many people knew someone to get in? Everyone raised their hand but me. Isn't that you know? funny? And it was funny. And then they were like, people from Buffalo want to raise their hand or greater Buffalo. I'm, like, I'm from Brooklyn. Like it was, just, it's different because I'm Caribbean and the way I grew up was a lot different. I'm like, I went to high school in Brooklyn. It was a lot of high school for me. It was different trying to be fit in because certain things, I'm like, just don't do, right? Like when I go home, I'm thinking about food, something as simple as that. I'm like, rice and stewed chicken. I, I was bringing that to my husband. What's that? What's oxtail? I don't need that. Like it was just different. And then I think one thing I think we started doing is diversity and like potlucks. You get to learn a lot to people. I've never uh, had Polish food before. I got to eat Polish food. It was really good. I got to eat Spanish food. I got to bring some of my Caribbean food. And now Microsoft does a really good job. They got BAM, we can talk. We got different things that we can integrate. Even if I'm feeling like my team doesn't offer them, there's a place for me to go talk to someone who's experiencing something similar, whether it's leadership, whether it's other skills. I know as a leader, sometimes we feel like that's not our job, but I think for our employees, it is because they spend a lot of time at work, right? And I realize the companies that I that went to, like when I went to Ingram, I loved Ingram. I thought I was there for seven years. Right. Because it had a good balance, right? Yeah. Of work. You did earn a lot. And you also did have a sense of a family, right? I went to other companies where it was completely transactional and you felt something like, this is it really this bad? Like, why am I competing? We can have a conversation. I can share this. And you still can get promoted. But you felt like you had to keep everything close because it wasn't as a warm feeling like I had in a couple of companies, right? Now let's talk about how do you integrate DEI principles into your work as a sales consultant and executive coach? Yeah, I think for me, it's just so embedded in who I am. Frankly, it's one of those things where you ask a few questions about the culture. You start asking about how you just there, especially from a, a recruiting perspective. And it's just part of who I am and coach to it. I talk through it. It's just embedded in me now. And I think when I ran the campus in Buffalo, That was a big part of it because you want to know that it's that culture that you want to create when I'm talking about whether it's the the sales culture, we're doing some training or sales consulting with the culture of your company. So that's really going to give me some insight into, do you like the culture that you have? Is it the culture that the CEO believes? Is it the culture that the worker believes, right? There's Mm -hmm. a different thought process on what that culture really is. So that's probably my very first question. I want to talk to the leadership. That's where I start off. 
But I always want to spend time with the front line and I want to spend time with the line managers because that's where I'm really going to get the understanding of what the true processes are, what the true customer is, what the true customer experience is, because you've got an idea of what it is. They know what it is. And then you just weave it all together. And that makes sense because sometimes when you become a layer or two removed, reality doesn't match up to people on the ground. I remember when I switched from being an individual contributor, talking directly with a customer as a technology consultant and switching to a part of marketing, right? Now I'm one layer removed. I got to go through a sales engineer or a sales rep to ask what the customer wants. In your case, like developmental culture, right? What I feel as someone who just came in might be different. I think we do a really great job at embracing the new employees and you find out you don't. Right? right? Because there's certain things, like even when we talk, I'm like, hey, how was the experience for you going through the stuff I sent out? Was it good? Can I fix it? Was it enough? Right? Because before I had a call to talk to people, I'm like, I don't got time to set up two calls, sorry. And I'm like, why don't I just have a, why don't I have like questions for them to look at? Right? Again, but I had to talk to my guests to tell me if it was good enough or not. And we're going to change gears because on my channel, I love talking to the people entry, middle level, or aspiring to be leaders, right? So let's talk about what advice would you give to women aspiring to reach a senior executive role? First thing, and I think I mentioned it earlier, make the decision to do it. We need more women leaders, and I'm just going to throw it out there. We need more women of color. We need more men of color, but we definitely need more women leaders. Yeah. So make that decision. Just take it. I can honestly tell you, make that leap to say yes, that I want to do it. The second thing is find yourself a good mentor. And I would say maybe even multiple mentors. Find one within your company because that's going to be incredibly important. And I would also say outside the company because it's always nice to have a different thought process. And I always try and get somebody older and somebody younger. That was my goal in when I was looking for mentorship. But also... Make sure you're having a really good conversation with your boss. What do they see? They may not believe in you as, way, the, as much as you believe in yourself, but they're, they can give you some good golden insights, right? What do they see as your weaknesses or your challenges? What are your strengths? But really dive into that and then take their feedback. If you're just really young in your career, try and get some a little bit more feedback than just your boss. Did you have a couple other bosses? But I think if you're, by the time you get to that, You've been in your career five, maybe seven years. You, you're going to start hearing the same things, right? You need to work on this and this. Put a plan together and work on it, right? Because you're really, the, it's going to be about telling the story to convince them that, yes, they need to back you. And if they never do, then go find another mentor, right? Go find that mentor that can take you to that next level. I think that's incredibly important. And I would say invest in yourself, right? Take the time to do the development work. It, it's not easy. But if it's what you really want, you'll do it. Oh, your network. I did remember it. Build your network. That is probably by far the most important thing you can do. Build your network and understand that everybody that you engage with has an experience with you and you never know where that person is going to end up. When you're climbing the ladder, make sure you're very careful that you don't step on a lot of fingers because you don't know where that finger is going to wind up and how they're going to. So really look at people. It goes back to, it sounds so silly, but it's the golden rule, right? Treat everybody well, and it will pay off in the long run. Some people you do have to keep a little bit of a distance because you don't trust them. That's okay. Sometimes you want to pull those people you don't trust in a little closer, but just treat everybody well and build your network. Yeah, I'm glad you ended with that because your network is exactly what's going to propel you going forward. Absolutely. Um, a lot of my latest roles, I knew the person or I knew the manager. I still have to do the interview, of course, but I, they knew what I could do already. Then invest in yourself. I try to read a hundred books or listen to them. I go to workshops. I set aside each year on training activities that I can use. That doesn't mean I use all $7,000, but I try my best to get better because I know there's areas that I can get better when I'm hanging out with people like yourself. I got the chance to go meet some of the executives at Ingram or, or when I was at Microsoft. I remember meeting Paul Bay and this dude was reading stuff that I didn't even understand. I'm like, what? The, 
I didn't know you need to learn about that. And he was like, his engineering is like in rocket science or something crazy like that. I'm like, dude, what you read? I'm realizing when I met all of my partners, I'm like, he would read all these different books like Sly, you just got to get better. Every day, if you get it 1% better, how good could you be? So that's what I do. Every day I have an hour of training, whether it's technical training or soft skills training. Like I meant to call that. But another thing that I just learned, I wish I learned a little bit sooner in my career, is sponsors, right? Versus mentors, right? And then like, now that I have that, I have a couple of mentors internal, but I realized I didn't have a sponsor who could get me to my next role. Who's going to really vouch for me and say, Sly, I know you see him as a tech. I know you see him as a marketing. He's still a wild card. He does a lot of stuff outside of work, but he's good at this. Let's do this. Are they willing to put their name on the line for you, right? To get there, you're going to need, well, as a male ally or a female ally or someone outside to really vouch for you. I found that really helps you get to that next level. The first thing you said is you have to make the decision. So many times I find even myself seesawing, right? What I want to do. And then you like, Sly, I can't help you. I don't know what you need help with. What do you want? You're doing this over here or are you doing this? Which one do you want? I'm like, hey, Susan, I want to be a VP one day. Okay, that's great. What's the plan on getting there? What do you need from me? Okay, you're at this level now. What is the plan? And come prepared to have that conversation instead of having the other person tell you what to do. I'm realizing you have to take that initiative up front. Great tips. Again, trending down now, the future of work. We're going to talk about trends, especially in concern D. AI and leadership, because the landscape is changing with AI, is changing the way we go on remote work. How do you see the trends and how do we prepare for that? Oh, so I think the remote work is a big one because when you start thinking about the, you know, there's so many biases. First of all, we're all biased. There's no question about it. Everybody has biases, but the bias that I'm really concerned about, and I think it's going to affect more women, frankly, than men is the bias of being in the office, right? Because yeah. you're seen versus being unseen. Yeah, That to me is going to be really critical for women because um, more women are embracing that work from home. They've got maybe a few more things from a home front that they need to be home for. Getting kids off the bus, just throwing laundry in on your lunch. Those little things that can really make your household go a lot smoother for your life. But I think we're going to have to make sure that you get into that office, you get some type of FaceTime so that you're not forgotten because that is my biggest concern for women. How are you going to be forgotten? You're doing a great job, but it's like you're in the office. I can go talk to you really quick. And so it's just, oh, that special project. Sly's right there. I can talk. I can bring my office real quick. I'm going to call this person that I never see. Oh, that's right. Susan, that's right. She works remote. Figuring out how we make sure that we all have that level playing field when it comes to opportunities, projects, things that can really move your career forward. Having just walk to your point when you said, just walking in the door with somebody, just so you can have a quick hello and, oh, yeah, they were walking in the same time I was, or we drank the same coffee. Just that little bit of knowing you always puts you a little bit ahead of somebody else. So I think that's going to be a very big trend. I do think the AI, from a diversity perspective, we got to be very careful because as it's written, it, there's biases built into the code. So we've got to be very careful how we use AI for recruiting, for everything, frankly, how we're even, we're all throwing things with chat GPT. And then I think just the training, I, because here's the interesting thing. I don't think, I mean, I could be wrong, but I don't think the qualities of a leader, but what's needed for a leader are going to change. Maybe tweak here and there. They have to be authentic. They have to lead with a purpose. They have to be a good communicator. They have all those pieces that whether you're doing a remote, sometimes your remote is even more important. So I, I think it's making sure that we are developing people and that we're using, uh, that it doesn't just fall to the easiest, right? We're going to really challenge ourselves to make sure that we're getting development and training out to everybody. I think the training is going to change a lot too. How we train, what we train with AI, all the changes just to how our jobs are going to, what jobs are going to be out there. I don't even know what jobs are going to be out there. So that's just going to be very interesting to see. Oh yeah, it's going to be tough. And then we're not going to see that because we've seen how, I'm seeing a lot of roles change. I saw a company got rid of their people who stock shelves and got a robot. And I pay someone in Indonesia $3 an hour to run the robot and they don't live in the store, right? I used to do a lot of long form 
videos on YouTube. But lately I've been doing more vertical you know, because people like short 30, 40 That's second short. videos. So then even now my trainings, I'm doing, I'm going to have an option where you just do, and it's going to be like a hundred, one minute, but people prefer that. Like this attention span, even when I'm engaging now, I've been using those and I realized it wasn't any person of color. It wasn't no one there. Right. And even when you did, they got the personal color. It didn't have a, a voice that would, uh, I think that I, I should, have, right. Like it didn't sound like someone, a person of color. That just depends on where you are. But I just saw so many little things that I'm realizing that's changing. And even for me, you gotta be able to use AI. It's not going anywhere. It's like my parents, they don't know how to use the internet that well. And you see them have a hard time. Now. And I feel like if you don't know how to use internet, like AI, you're going to have a hard time going forward. Right? People see all the bad things about it, but how can it make you more efficient? Right. I can tell you right now, sometimes I suck at tone. What tone is Susan saying? Is she angry? Sometimes AI, I can ask a question. We, when you read this message, what are you feeling in it? And they're like, oh, or now that I know you're a senior executive, how should I phrase this? Am I writing it in a tone? And it will help me say, all right, so I change these things out and I'll go fix it. And then I'll send it to you. Then I get a positive response. So how can you use it to right. make yourself a little bit easier? So that's what I'm trying to do now. And then how do you use that to empower your team? Like I remember my older brother, his best friend had a, a, a law office. I'm like, man, I know you can't use it for legal, but I brought it to my lawyer and the lawyer's like, man, you went to another lawyer? I'm like, nah, chat GPT wrote this. Everything good? Trying to fix two or three things. I'm like, dude, why just don't make a whole bunch of templates, sell it to your team, have a couple of paralegals with this. And you have one lawyer who just read over all the stuff before you send it out. And then you can now cut down your overhead. How do you use the technology to solve more business challenges? So I think the way we do work will be different. It's like people thought it was the end of the world when we switched from horses to cars, right? Just the way it looked is going to be different. But if you don't make those changes, I think life is going to be really hard. Even my daughter, I'm not going to force her into tech, but I'm going to have her have a strong background in math. I'm going to have her understand it so she's not intimidated by it. Because sometimes when you're not exposed to those things, you get intimidated. You don't even take the chance to bet on yourself. What's the lessons you learn? Like, how do you continue to grow and stay motivated in your professional journey? We talked about it a little bit, but can you share a little bit more on that? Because I feel like my tagline for Tech Simplify is always be learning, right? You know, I should add on and growing, right? Learning and adopting what you learn, right? The people learn that and they never use it, right? You gotta actually use it to see if it worked or not. What's your process to that? To me, that's, and, and for, from a motivational perspective, my motivation is that there's, if you look at my yoga, I'm very high altruism, very high learner. So for me, if I can continue to help people, that keeps me motivated. I really do enjoy working with people. And if I can continue to learn and grow, that's just a no-brainer. And if I can continue to grow this business, I'll be thrilled. All right. Let's transition into the quick fire round. What book has had the most significant impact on your professional life? The Seven Habits of Highly Successful People. That book game changed how I set my goals, how I set myself up for success. The second book that changed my life was Large Account Management by Miller Hyman. And I read that and that really helped me understand how to manage and grow customers. And so those two books, I think, were the most pivotal in my career. Oh, that's excellent. For me, it was what got you here won't get you there. It's and a, be so good, they can't annoy you. I like that. Really the other good one book. that was good was the first 90 days, because I changed positions a lot. That was a very good one. So next question, is, if you could give one piece of advice to your younger self, what would it be? Don't take yourself so seriously. I would just say, don't take yourself so seriously. What a daily habit that you swear by for maintaining productivity and balance? I have a routine. So for me, it's exercise. Exercise is just something that I think is really important. But it's um, daily gratitude. I, I have a journal. I've been doing this for a very long time. It's embarrassing. Like when I die and my boys pull out my journals out, they're going to think my mother was crazy because I just had pages and pages of gratitude. And they're always in it, my boys. I just so my children. Um, and then the other thing that I think is really important is, you know, I ask every day. It's like, I need to be my best. And everybody has their own spiritual 
But to me, you have to ask, you know, I want to be present today. I want to be productive. And if you ask, you throw it out to the heavens and the gods, it's amazing what you get done. So it's not taking it for granted. It's being thankful and asking for help and asking to make the most of each and every day. And it, you go in being it's very purposeful, right? I start the same with exercise. Then I read my um, daily affirmation I got in front of me. Um, I got a journal to figure out what I did yesterday, what I like, where can I got better? Um, where did I lose patience? Where was a better chance where I was able to learn first or teach first? Even being a parent, sometimes for me, you get upset. Oh, Communication yeah. breaks down where I could have educated instead of yelling or instead of being short. And I realized then what triggered that? Find those down, so I write them down. So it's funny when you look back, I look back to some of my journals from college and a lot of the things that I was trying to figure it out. Like you said, I stopped taking it so serious, but I'm glad I wrote it down. Amazing. You write them down and they become real. 